the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in bodily form as a dove. And a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. In the name of the living and true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. This feast is nestled quietly in the shadows of the Christmas celebration. It's a bit like a network TV show that airs after the Super Bowl. And yet, it would be hard to overstate the importance of this event in God's plan of salvation. It has been pointed out that our Lord's birth is recorded only two times in the Gospels, in Matthew and Luke, while the account of his baptism is given in all four. Taking a cue from Holy Scripture, some early church fathers make the case that Jesus' baptism is actually more significant than his nativity. For example, St. Maximus of Turin, a bishop in the early 5th century, writes on this feast, of this feast, he says, Today, then, is another kind of birth of the Savior. We see him born with the same sort of signs, the same sort of wonders, but with greater mystery. The Holy Spirit, who was present to him then in the womb, now pours out upon him in the torrent. He who then purified Mary for him, now sanctifies the running waters for him. The Father, who then overshadowed in power, now cries out with his voice. He who then, as if choosing the more prudent course, manifested himself as a cloud at the nativity, now bears witness to the truth. So God says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Clearly, the second birth is more excellent than the first. The one brought forth Christ in silence and without a witness. The other baptized the Lord gloriously with a profession of divinity. Did you notice that St. Maximus actually refers to our Lord's baptism as his second birth? This is provocative language, which of course points directly to what happens for us in our own baptism. It is our second birth, our rebirth, our born again experience. Jesus' baptism is indeed a glorious epiphany, a magnificent revelation. It is a theophany, that is, a manifestation of God to humanity. And there are two critically important and interconnected aspects of this epiphany, which we do well to ponder on this feast. The first is that at his baptism, Jesus is revealed as the Christ. Christos is a Greek word. Its Hebrew counterpart is Messiah. Both of them mean anointed one. For generations, the people of Israel had been waiting for the Messiah, the Christ, the promised anointed one, a coming king who would be David's true heir, through whom Yahweh would rescue Israel from all their enemies. Many thought John the Baptist might be this anointed one. In fact, in the beginning of today's gospel, St. Luke writes, as the people were in expectation and all men questioned in their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he were the Christ. But John knows he is not. He knows Jesus is the true Messiah, which is why he points the people away from himself and towards Jesus. That, by the way, is a whole different sermon. Our job as Christians is to point people away from ourselves and towards our Lord. We'll leave that for another time. John baptizes Jesus. At first, he is reluctant and even refuses. We know this from St. Matthew's Gospel. But Jesus insists, explaining to John that it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So John baptizes Jesus, and when he does, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in bodily form as a dove. This descent of the Holy Spirit upon the Son, this is the action of anointing. 
the unction come down from above. This is the revelation to the whole world that Jesus is in truth the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one of God. Now at this point, there is an important clarification that needs to be made, which is this. Jesus does not become the Messiah in this moment. The Holy Spirit always rests upon him. Rather, it is at his baptism that this eternal reality of his identity is revealed and made known in a clear and unmistakable way to us. This is the first aspect of the epiphany that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God. And the second aspect is like unto it. At the baptism of Jesus, God reveals himself as the most holy trinity. And these two revelations are connected in this way. At Jesus' baptism, the Father anoints the Son with the Holy Spirit. And here we see clearly the three persons of the Holy Trinity acting in concert with one another. One theologian explains it this way. For there to be a Christ, an anointed son, there must be one who anoints him, that is, the Father. There must also be one who is the unction, that is, the Holy Spirit, who remains on him. Therefore, we cannot think of Christ without thinking at the same time of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Without them, the word Christ would have no meaning. We cannot confess Jesus as Christ without confessing the one God as God in three persons. So, at his baptism, Jesus is revealed as the Christ and God is revealed as the most holy trinity. No wonder this event is included in all four Gospels. The primary objective of human life is to love God and love our neighbor. Our ability to achieve this objective has been marred by our sin, but marvelously restored through our Lord Jesus Christ. The 5th century Bishop of Ravenna, St. Peter of Chrysologus, writes, Today the Holy Spirit hovers over the waters in the likeness of a dove. A dove announced to Noah that the flood had disappeared from the earth. So now a dove is to reveal that the world's shipwreck is at an end forever. The people of Israel awaited a Messiah who would save them from their enemies. Little did they know that their enemy, indeed our enemy, the great nemesis of all humanity, is sin which leads to death. We are the ones who drew the heavenly curtain closed in turning away from God, but God sent his Son into the world to reopen the heavens so that in Christ our relationship with God could be permanently restored. And this restoration, this salvation, it begins when we are reborn through the waters of baptism. Through baptism, we are anointed with the same Holy Spirit. We become living members of the body of the Anointed One, the body of Christ. We become sons and daughters, adopted sons and daughters of God the Father and heirs of his eternal kingdom. This is why the core of the baptismal covenant is the profession of the Apostles' Creed, where we profess our belief in the Holy Trinity in God the Father, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit. This is why we are baptized not just with water, but with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Through baptism, we enter into the very life of the Holy Trinity, whose name we profess. Our baptism is not an end, but rather a beginning. It is the beginning of our relationship within the Godhead. And like any relationship, it is living and dynamic. Like any relationship, it can be good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, fruitful or unfruitful. 
But unlike any other relationship that we have, there is only one variable which can determine the nature of our relationship with God, and that is us. We are the variable. God is the constant. The Most Holy Trinity is all-loving and perfectly faithful. We might say God the Holy Trinity is the perfect friend, better yet, the perfect spouse, patient and kind, not jealous or boastful, not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way, is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in right. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, even us. God never fails. If then we are the variable, what shall we do? How shall we live? It's actually quite simple. The answer is simple. We do what we said we would do and we live how we said we would live in accordance with the promises and vows we make in our own baptismal covenant. This is our recipe for a healthy, growing relationship with God the Most Holy Trinity. This is our recipe for salvation. Let us then at every turn remember our baptismal covenant. That's why a little stoop of holy water is at the entrance of the church to remind us upon entering and upon leaving of the vows we make before God in our baptismal covenant. Let us remember those vows in that covenant, and with God's help, let us endeavor to keep those vows and that covenant. That our Father in heaven might say to us what he said to our Lord at his baptism, you are my beloved sons and daughters with whom I am well pleased. In the name of the living and true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.